Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. It's just delightful to see you here. Um, I'm Richard Williams, the Principal and Vice-Chancellor, and it's my pleasure to, in a moment, introduce our inaugural lecture. Um, but first of all, to say again, welcome, Chancellor. Really delightful to, to see you here. Well, for me, it's always such a pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce the inaugural lecture, because, of course, inaugural lecture presents three things, I think. First of all, it's the opportunity to celebrate the personal success of an academic who has been appointed to what is the, the highest academic post in the university. Secondly, and we'll judge this later, it's an opportunity to hear the story of this person's vision for the future and what's brought them here in terms of their own academic skill described in language that is understandable. <laughs> and thirdly, it's such an opportunity also to acknowledge people along the pathway that have been influential in the life of the academic and also people who've enabled the person to be in their post, uh, the means through which their post has been uh, sponsored and paid for. So those are the three special things for me about the evening. And, of course, tonight is especially notable because here we are in the former home of Adam Smith, the house um, that actually provided the inspiration and the context for the Adam Smith Chair in Sustainable Capitalism, which we'll hear about. And as we hear about this uh, particular uh, mission ahead, it's going to be about a focus that connects uh, global finance and its role also with the role of the state and with the role of corporations. And we'll be hearing from that, um, from Adam on that. So as we join in congratulating Adam Dixon in a few minutes on his appointment, um, it's great to welcome academic colleagues, um, great to welcome uh, members of the university court, great to welcome uh, sponsors and friends. Uh, you're all extremely welcome. But most of all, it's great to welcome you, Adam's family, here on the front row. And Sarah and Olga and Faye and Juno, it's really great to have you here. <laughs> now, this evening's lecture and this event couldn't be more poignant because, as many of you will know, 2023 marks the tercentenary of Adam Smith, 300 years since he was born. And in this very place where we are today, there have been conversations about the topics that have been echoing around that are in resonance with the stories that we'll hear tonight. And um, before I introduce Adam formally, um, I just wanted to ask Dr. Carolyn Howitt, who's the director of Pamela House, to say something about this special place. So, Carolyn, please come and say a few words. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. And it's a real pleasure to see so many familiar faces here tonight, uh, many of whom will have heard the following story more than once. <laughs> but it's a good story, so it's, it's worth retelling, and um, it should be particularly relevant and interesting for those of you who have not visited us at Panmure before, to whom we give a special welcome. So Panmere House is a very ancient building. It's now more than 350 years old. It was built in 1691 and was quickly the town seat of the Earl of Panmure, which is how it got its name. But it came to prominence in the late 18th century when it became the final remaining home of Adam Smith. Now, when you entered this evening, you'll have come past, I hope, a beautiful first edition of the Wealth of Nations on display in our lobby area. Uh, that's all the way from 1776. Now, first editions are rare and very beautiful, there's no doubt, but the definitive edition of that work is actually the ninth edition, and that was written here in Panmere House, most likely in this very room where we're gathered tonight. He also edited the final edition of the Theory of Moral Sentiments, which was his first and equally brilliant work of moral philosophy while he was living here. And that's, in fact, what he was working on when he died here in the house in 1790. 
And across the preceding 12 years, working just up the Royal Mile at Customs House, he also hosted a lot of the other leading lights of the Scottish Enlightenment. He used to come and visit him here every Sunday. So downstairs in the reading room, where we'll gather later on this evening, he used to gather together these leading figures to dine together and, crucially, to debate big ideas. And as we know, of course, the big ideas of the Scottish Enlightenment still bear much resonance today, which makes Panmure House not just an incredible piece of Scottish history, but an incredible piece of global history as well. In 2008, it was the vision of the leadership of Edinburgh Business School and Harriet Watt University to rescue the building from dereliction and to restore it as a place for research and debate into the huge economic and social questions of our time, just as Smith used it in his. So it took 10 years to complete the physical restoration, and it's now the great privilege of the Panmere House team to continue the intellectual restoration. And we do that through a range of programming designed to encourage new Enlightenment thinking and to encourage a more philosophical and long-term approach to questions. So while I don't wish to place any undue pressure on tonight's speaker, it's fair to say that from the Harriet Watt perspective, tonight's lecture has been 15 years in the making. Indeed, arguably, 250 if you want to trace it right back to the last time a professor named Adam did research here at Panmere House. <laughs> and there are, of course, dozens of people who've been instrumental in bringing us to this point, and I just want to take a couple of moments to single out for special thanks one or two people who are here this evening. So firstly, James Anderson, Tom Coots, and Bailey Gifford, whose support has been genuinely transformational for this project. All of our flagship programming, the Panmere House Prize, the Adam Smith Lecture Series, the Smith School Series, and indeed, of course, this new chair in sustainable capitalism, these have all been made possible by their tremendous generosity. Uh, Graham Watson, who sadly is trapped in Persia tonight because of the uh, red weather warning, but he's really one of Panmere's unsung heroes, um, and he's supported the project for many, many years now, firstly in his position um, on Harriet Watt University Court, and latterly as the chair of the Panmere House Advisory Board. Professor Heather McGregor, who also sadly can't be with us tonight, but who is the undisputed dynamo behind the restoration of Panmere House, and indeed Professor Angus Lang, who is her successor as the Dean of Edinburgh Business School, and who I know is every bit as committed to Panmere's next phase. And finally, our Principal and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Richard Williams, without whose vision and leadership this project could not have become what it is today and to whose stewardship I shall now return you. So welcome once again, and I hope you all enjoy your evening. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you for all the commitment that you do for this place too. It's fantastic. So for those of you who may be less familiar with the wider university, I couldn't stand here before introducing Adam to tell you just a couple of sentences about our university. Um, Harriet Watt University was formed in 1821 to provide societally focused business and technological education. And now through our five campus locations um, in three countries, that's in Scotland, in the United Arab Emirates, and in Malaysia, um, we're pleased to be a truly multinational university. About one third of our students are based in Scotland. Um, and so we are... Um, uh, probably the most multinational university in the UK, and we're well placed to continue our mission to advance Scottish knowledge, Scottish values, in all of our locations through our alumni. We have around 152,000 living alumni in 198 countries. So what better setting to drive enlightenment and our links with Adam Smith and the chair we're going to celebrate tonight, but through our whole university network across the world. And Adam, who's lurking behind that door and listening to us, now, Adam, it's uh, customary on me these occasions to present a very brief summary of uh, the professional journey of our inaugural professor. And it's very brief, and I'll take to do that. And so with Adam's forgiveness, um, here goes. So... Adam's background brings a very distinctive international approach to the university because he trained as an economic geographer and a political economist. 
and he has developed his academic career through appointments in the UK at the University of Bristol and in the Netherlands at the University of Maastricht, where he led a large European Research Council project on sovereign wealth funds. He holds a DPhil from the University of Oxford, a diploma from the Institut d'études politiques de Paris, and BAs um, in international affairs and Spanish literature from George Washington University. So Adam, I have no hesitation in describing you as a true polymath, since your skills and achievements extend even beyond the topics I know that I've mentioned here. And so it only remains for me to invite you to please come in and to present your lecture. And I hope, I hope I've got most of your history right, Adam. And just to say, there will be an opportunity to ask questions um, after your lecture. So, Adam, over to you. Thank you so much. Well, good evening. Um, it, is, um, it is such a great pleasure to see all of you here at Adam Smith's Panmere House with, to share what is definitely um, an important moment in my life and career. I never thought I would be giving an inaugural lecture. <laughs> well, I, I thought I'd be giving an inaugural lecture. <laughs> um, but in the very room, as Caroline mentioned, where Adam Smith reworked his two great masterworks. Um, nor did I foresee having the honor of holding a chair in his name. But unfortunately, tonight's lecture is not going to be on Adam Smith. But it goes without saying that Panmere House, for me, is an unbelievable opportunity to advance my scholarship. But I see this position as so much greater than me. We have, as Caroline mentioned, an amazing piece of not simply Scottish, but of world heritage that we must protect. But Panmere House is not a museum to the life and works of Adam Smith, but that legacy and that legacy of the Scottish Enlightenment, however imperfect the time was and however imperfect the thinkers were, can still serve as a reminder of what matters. We take for granted at our peril how fragile our freedoms are from our ability to express ourselves and our ability to challenge and debate ideas. Without that, we fail to address injustice in the world in all its forms. Now, while Smith is known as the father of economics, he can also be seen as a theorist of non-domination. Throughout Smith's works, we see a concern with showing how power and domination operated, what its origins were, and what conditions were necessary for its removal. Panmere House is in this respect, an opportunity. It is our opportunity to rekindle the Scottish Enlightenment. It is our opportunity to elevate and convene debate, dialogue, and cutting edge research on the world's most pressing challenges, from inequality and climate change to the erosion of democracy and trust in government and the market economy. It is our opportunity to help address those challenges for the greatest benefit of all. Hence, I feel a great sense of responsibility in helping Panmere House live up to its potential. But I won't be doing this alone. I wouldn't be here today without the support of more individuals than I have time to mention, including colleagues and mentors, past and present, that are here with me tonight. Um, but I'd like to acknowledge the support, at least some, before de delving into tonight's lecture. As was mentioned, the chair position and many of our other programs here at Panmere House have been made possible by the generous support of Bailey Gifford, who, and this is why I want to mention it again, in my interactions with them, they value lateral and heterodox thinking, which is something we need more of in the world. I would also like to thank the senior management of Harry Watt University and the University Court for seeing the value and possibilities of Panmere House. I can't mention everybody, but I would like to thank our chancellor, Sir Professor, Professor Sir Jeff Palmer, our principal and vice chancellor, Richard Williams, Bruce Pritchard, our chair of the university court, and um, Professor Dame Heather McGregor, as, as Caroline mentioned, was so crucial to, to Panmere House, and my boss, uh, Professor Angus Lang of Edinburgh Business School. Now, the other group I'd like to thank um, is the team here at Panmere House, Laura Smith Gulliver, Sarah Chung, and, Sarah, uh, and Bear Blair Barrows. They are committed, as you will have already seen this evening, to making the experience for those that walk through the doors perfect, such as during our events during the Fringe 
or our Adam Smith lecture series. And of course, I cannot thank enough Dr. Caroline Howitt for her work and creativity in bringing Panmere House back to life. She has worked tireless, tirelessly, and she continues to work tirelessly to deliver on the potential that, uh, that Panmere House has to offer. And she's also been known to put on a costume of Adam Smith and walk down <laughs> Fifth Avenue in New York. So she is definitely very serious. <laughs> and finally, I'd like to thank uh, my family. My parents always, that's great. <laughs> my, my, parents, my parents always allowed me to, to follow my own path and for that I'm grateful. My mother who has flown in from Colorado, um, for her taking this position yeah. is quite special. She has a significant, a very significant amount of Scottish heritage. And she likes to joke, but I think she's probably serious that the ancestors have something to do with me being here. I'm also uh, delighted that my two beautiful daughters, Faye and Juno, are here, Faye, that's great, <laughs> here this evening. Um, she's 11 and a half, so. <laughs> they are, over anything else, uh, the, the people that bring me the most joy in life. Um, everything else is just filler. And the person who I must thank the most, the person who brought my two beautiful little girls into the world, the person who was the first to tell me to take this job even before it was offered, the person who, like my daughters, is also very beautiful, my wife, Olga. She has been instrumental to supporting my academic career from the beginning, and I couldn't be where I am today and where I intend to go without her. So the title of my lecture this evening is From State Capitalism to Sustainable Capitalism. My aim is to introduce you to some of the work that I've been doing in recent years and which I will continue in some form. I will do my best to avoid too much academic jargon, but some is inevitable. There are parts of my lecture that deal with theory that you may find somewhat or very abstract or at least unfamiliar. But hopefully the headline narrative will be clear enough that you will go away this evening having learned something new. Namely, how we can or should understand the shape of capitalism today. Much of this lecture reflects my collaboration with Dr. Ilya Salami, a brilliant and highly productive scholar I was fortunate to have as a postdoc for three years between 2018 and 2021, and with whom I have continued to collaborate. He and I recently completed a monograph entitled The Specter of State Capitalism, which should appear in print sometime next year. The other part of this lecture reflects my collaboration with another brilliant postdoc I had the pleasure of having, Dr. Milan Babich. My work with Milan, as you will see, is interested in understanding the decarbonization potential of states as owners. Now, I'd like to pose a question. When someone says state capitalism, what comes to mind? Now, I imagine for most of you, you immediately think of China or some other emerging market where the state has a large footprint in the economy. I doubt any of you thought of countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, or Norway for that matter. Maybe you thought of France, perhaps. Or maybe you didn't think of whole countries. Perhaps you thought of large state-owned enterprises or sovereign wealth funds or state-owned banks. Or perhaps you thought of industrial policies, for example. After tonight, you'll have a new, I'd, and I'd argue more robust, understanding of what state capitalism is and how we can use state capitalism as an analytical concept to understand the more visible and materially significant role of states in the global economy today. Now, my entry, excuse me, my entry into thinking about state capitalism comes through my work on sovereign wealth funds. I've been researching sovereign wealth funds for, which are state-owned institutional investors for more than 15 years. Now, why I find sovereign funds so interesting to study is that in them we can study everything from geopolitics and economic development, all the way to theories of the state and political economy, or the economic geography of the investment management industry. I've also been drawn to studying sovereign funds because they exist in countries rich, in countries poor, and from developed liberal democracies to authoritarian single-party states. In short, sovereign funds offer a compelling entry point to studying political economy across a range of geographies and topics. But I've also been drawn to researching sovereign funds because their numbers have increased nearly sixfold in the last two decades. What is more, their assets under management uh, have increased to over $10 trillion. By comparison, pension funds in OECD countries hold around $50 to $60 trillion. 
Hence, sovereign funds as a group are bo by no means large or huge, but they are in not insignificant either. And it is true that a small number of sovereign funds, like those of Norway, China, and the Middle East, hold the vast bulk of that capital. But the increase in, of states establishing a sovereign fund should not be ignored, as it necessarily means more states are becoming active players in the market, whether at home or abroad. At the same time, as sovereign funds have expanded, an even more significant growth has occurred in the weight of state-owned enterprises in the global economy. Their assets are now at least half of global GDP, and many state-owned enterprises are among the largest companies by market capitalization and revenue. To be sure, part of this growth can be attributed to the ma massive growth of the Chinese economy and its state sector. But even if we take China out, we see a revival of state-owned enterprises, where renationalizations are on the agenda again, even in the most liberal political economies. Indeed, the irony of the privatization of rail and utilities here in Britain has been that the buyers were often state-owned enterprises or sovereign funds from other countries. Now, what is important about the growth of sovereign funds and state-owned enterprises is that they are now a major force of transnationalizing capital, active in cross-border mergers and acquisitions, portfolio investment, and other foreign direct investment. To add to this, we've also seen a massive expansion of national development and policy banks in developing and, importantly, developed countries. There are more than 900 worldwide, controlling $49 trillion of assets. While these state capital hybrids, as we call them, have become important engines of global capitalism, we've also seen the emergence or re-emergence of industrial policy and national development strategies. Indeed, in a report published in 2018 by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, they noted since, 2008, since the 2008 global financial crisis, the number of countries adopting national ind industrial development strategies has increased dramatically. The rate of adoption of both formal industrial policies and individual policy measures targeted and at industrial sectors appears to be at an all-time high. Now, this is not to suggest that states had disappeared in the decades prior, a period that some refer to as neoliberal globalization. But we cannot deny that a major reorientation of activist state policy is underway. This was evident already before the pandemic, but has only increased since. One simply need to look at the massive government spending programs in the United States or Europe in support of the energy transition to see that we are moving in new directions. Indeed, industrial policy is no longer a bad word. Just as an anecdote, I was on a panel at the OECD in 2016, and the then head of the development center, Mario Pezzini, remarked with some enthusiasm that it was again possible to talk about industrial policy. We also need to add the massive and unconventional monetary policies we had until recently, namely quantitative easing. Central banks are notionally independent, but their links with the state run deep. At the same time, we saw huge bailouts for the private sector after the 2008 crisis and during the pandemic. Likewise, we have seen simmering trade wars between the US and China, and political leaders, even in the liberal heartlands, talking openly, or at least implying, economic nationalism. In short, the state is back. Now, is what we are seeing state capitalism? When I began, began my European Research Council funded project on sovereign wealth funds in 2018, I had already used the term state capitalism a few times in reference to the rise of sovereign funds, largely because others had done so as well. But I didn't find how state capitalism was used to be very robust. I was guilty of that as well. As I noticed state capitalism being used more and more, both in academic literature and in the media and by political analysts, it got me thinking. For one, I wasn't satisfied with how state capitalism as a real world phenomenon was portrayed. I wasn't going to accept that state capitalism just applied to China when there was so much else going on, particularly in the liberal heartlands of the global economy. At the same time, I wasn't satisfied with just accepting that the state is always fundamental to the operations of capital. It was clear that more conceptual work was needed. I was fortunate to then begin collaborating with Ilias, who was a source of countless ideas and theoretical insights to help make better sense of the issues at hand. We saw an opportunity to drive thinking in a different, and we'd argue more productive, direction. 
Now, when Ilias and I set off to map systematically how the term state capitalism was used by academics and by the business press and by think tanks, we found that it was being used to refer to a vast array of political and institutional forms. State capitalism was being used to describe sovereign wealth <laughs> funds, state-owned enterprises, national development banks, different models of post-developmentalism, post-neoliberalism, varieties of capitalism in China, Russia, Turkey, Indonesia, Singapore, or Hungary, for example. Or it was being used to describe and discuss industrial policy, and much more. While we found that some compelling contributions, in the main we were unsatisfied, it was unclear to us why any of these political and institutional forms would deserve the moniker state capitalism. Likewise, the term, the use of the term lacked sufficient analytical purchase. There are already rigorous terms and bundles of concepts which have been specifically developed for the study of these individual political and institutional forms. In other words, we don't need state capitalism to, to explain different political economic regimes where the state takes a more pronounced role, at least formally. Or we don't need state capitalism to discuss and analyze sovereign wealth funds for that matter. But we weren't satisfied with tossing out the term state capitalism. Besides, we felt we needed to address the issue with the term state capitalism given its increasing use and popularity. So what do we mean by state capitalism? We define state capitalism as the aggregate expansion of the state's role as promoter, supervisor, and owner of capital across the world economy. And this is characterized by two parallel developments. On the one hand, the expansion of the state's role as promoter, supervisor, and owner of capital is characterized by the multiplication of state capital hybrids and a geographical expansion of their control over resources and markets. In other words, it is characterized by the rise of sovereign funds, state-owned enterprises, and other institutions of state capital. On the other hand, the expansion of the state's role as promoter, supervisor, and owner of capital is characterized by the development of muscular forms of statism. That is, an explicit return to industrial policy, spatial development strategies, and economic nationalism. Consider, for example, the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, or China's Belt and Road Initiative, or the EU's response to the Belt and Road Initiative with its flagship Global Gateway Pro Project. Now, the added value for us of the category state capitalism resides precisely in that it calls for an understanding of the recent upward trajectory of these various political and institutional forms <coughs> together and in relation to each other. And this leads to several key questions. Why does state capitalism ascend? In other words, why are we seeing more state capital and more muscular forms of statism? How does it ascend? Why now? Indeed, we've seen statism of some form in the past. If anything, statism often appears to be the norm in the history of capitalism. Now, what are the implications? Oops, sorry. Does it just distort markets, or is, it, is this what is needed to address major global challenges? Does this increase the likelihood of geopolitical conflict? How can we explain its institutional diversity? Indeed, it is important not to see the rise of state capitalism as suggesting some kind of convergence toward a singular form of how markets are governed. There is still a lot of variation. However, many of, these, of the main type of approaches in the literature do not help us answer these questions. State capitalism is often treated as a national variety of capitalism, which is increasingly rivaling liberal market economies and transforming the liberal world order. Now the problem is that these explanations are inappropriately scaled. They demonstrate what we would call methodological nationalism or a, a preference for prioritizing the national political economy as the unit of analysis. Now this is not to suggest that the national level is not a very, if the most important unit in comparative analysis, or that it is wrong to claim that some political economies are more state capitalist, if you like, than others. So for example, China is certainly more state capitalist than America is, at least formally, but is naive to ignore how influential the American state is in shaping and defining markets. Same goes for the United Kingdom. Our concern is that many approaches fail to adequately account for connections between various repertoires of state intervention at scales beyond the nation state. 
Moreover, there is a failure to consider capitalism as a global phenomenon and to consider it as a totality and all the relations therein. Indeed, much of the literature provides little reflection on the historic development of global capitalism and the various changes in the spheres of production, circulation, and distribution of value at a planetary level. Equally problematic, we find the narrative of a clash between rival political economics as being limited. State capitalism is portrayed as applying to emerging markets or countries like China in an often pejorative manner as contrasted with a more pure and legitimate form of capitalism in the West. Now the problem with this is it limits our gaze as to the instances of state capitalism in the more liberal political economies of the world. Just consider as one example how large the US defense budget is every year. If it's not industrial policy, then I don't know what it is. Now the expansion of state capitalism as we define it is a process of state restructuring which must be grasped as a moment of the global dynamics of capital accumulation. State capitalism is a particular modality of expression of the capitalist state, including in its liberal form. And by liberal form, I'm referring to capitalist political economies such as Britain. Here is an aside you may be wondering what the difference is between the capitalist state and state capitalism. Indeed, some would say that the state is always necessary for capitalism and state capitalism is capitalism. That is true. In the history of capitalism, the state has been crucial for market formation, market development, and market correction, all with the aim of unlocking capital accumulation. However, for us, the capitalist state and state capitalism operate at two distinct levels of conceptual abstraction. The capitalist state must be seen as logically prior to state capitalism. And this has important theoretical implications. As such, we see state capitalism as an impulse, a potential response, if you like, which is contained in the form of the capitalist state and as such is built into its DNA. Moreover, and this is where our contribution, I think, is different, we locate state capitalism in its contemporary form within a set of processes pertaining to the historical development and geographical remaking of global capitalism. What this does is allows us to redirect characterization efforts away from constructing ideal typical models of state capitalism juxtaposed against other varieties of capitalism and towards identifying the circumstances and conditions in which the state capitalist impulse manifests across time and space. And there are two long-term transformations of capitalism that are most relevant for explaining, we think, the rise of state capitalism today. Now, this figure may look daunting, but I will walk you through it. It's simply a visualization of the argument. Now, over the last 30 or so years, or longer, the world economy has experienced two significant secular, or more simply, long-term capitalist transformations. On the one hand, the revolution in information and communications technologies from the 1980s onwards has supported the increasing automation, digitalization, and robotization of large-scale industry, large-scale and globally networked industry. And this has had important ramifications for the geography of production at a global scale. In advanced economies, this has led to the growth and prioritization of service-oriented or knowledge-based sectors in finance, law, and accountancy, and sectors at the leading edge of the technological frontier. Geographically, this has benefited major world cities and regions such as New York, London, Singapore, and Hong Kong for finance, and regions such as Silicon Valley and Shenzhen in technology. These cities and regions also benefit from hosting the transnational corporations that coordinate the various stages of production along crisscrossing value chains and global production networks, and in the process accumulate massive profits. Traditional manufacturing se sector, uh, centers such as the American Midwest or the north of England saw further acceleration of deindustrialization and a hollowing out of local economies which has had, had already begun as far back as the 1960s when manufacturing shifted to other peripheral regions in search of lower labor costs, namely Asia. By the 2000s, fueled by China's rapid ascendance as the factory of the world, the center of the global economy shifted firmly from the North Atlantic to the Pacific Rim. The late industrializing East Asian economies, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, quickly moved up the value chain into high technology sectors while low-skilled labor-intensive manufacturing con concentrated further in China and other parts of Southeast Asia, such as Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines. 
China's recent acceleration up the value chain, coupled with increasing labor costs, has seen further shifting of production elsewhere in Asia, such as Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos. Notwithstanding the relocation to Asia, manufacturing has also dispersed to other regions, such as northern Mexico, Morocco, Central and Eastern Europe, Turkey, and some parts of Central Asia. In short, there's been a profound remaking of the geography of production with a shift in the center of gravity from the North Atlantic to the Pacific Rim. Accompanying this changing geography of global production has been what some economists have referred to as secular stagnation. In short, advanced economies have entered a period of economic malaise that began before but was accelerated by the 2008 global financial crisis. Growth is sent hence slow, as is investment. A key contributing factor, as argued by more conventional economists, is the vitality of manufacturing in emerging markets, particularly China. By contrast, heterodox economists and historians claim that secular stagnation is part of a generalized crisis of overproduction, which began in the 1970s at the peak of the so-called golden age of capitalism after the Second World War. The expansion of the international division of labor and the intensification of comp competition through new entrants, namely China, has only served to intensify this process. But the boom in China has also now peaked with clear signs of an overaccumulation crisis. This points to a secular stagnation of capitalism globally. Now what this means for making profits is that it is more difficult. Corporations, as a result, have turned to short-term financial speculation and other forms of financial engineering, which some refer to as corporate financialization, in order to boost profits. For example, for example, after the 2008 global financial crisis, major central banks began massive quantitative easing programs, which significantly reduced the cost of capital for firms. Rather than investing in research and development, new markets, or productivity gains, many public corporations simply bought back their shares. Doing so boosted the share price making corporations look healthier and more profitable than they otherwise would be. Corporations have also sought to boost profits by acquiring competitors rather than investing in new production, while also erecting barriers to competition by locking in monopoly control through aggressive patenting practices. Overall, there has been a massive, if not unprecedented, centralization of capital in a smaller number of firms as an attempt to squeeze out more profit from an increasingly competitive world market. And here's where we see the emergence of state capitalism. State capitalism, again, must be understood as a process of self-transformation of capitalist states as they politically mediate these global but regionally uneven long-term changes in capitalism. This process of political mediation has involved significant changes in pre-existing landscapes of state intervention, a re-articulation of the relations between states and circuits of capital, and, again, a dramatic aggregate expansion of the role of states as supervisor, regulator, and direct owner of capital. And this is precisely the phenomenon that is now increasingly referred to, being referred to as the new state capitalism. In our work, we, we identify four state capitalist, capitalist impulses. And as I want to move on, I will mention just one, what we call a productivist impulse. This impulse we take is a process of state restructuring geared towards increased direct state intervention in production arrangements. This manifests, for example, through helping firms reach competitive positions in cutting edge industries, assisting firms in developing and monopolizing technological capabilities, and restructuring declining industries at home. The main instruments include, but are not limited to, new industrial strategies, credit subsidies, and state-owned enterprises. Now, what is crucial to take away from our, our argument is that the new state capitalism is not inward looking. It is important not to conflate the more visible role of the state as a search for protection from market forces. The new state capitalism is not some backlash against globalization. The new state capitalism is best seen as a complex reconfiguration and rescaling of political authority, sovereignty, and territoriality. There is, to be sure, a hardening of borders and a general what we can call securitization of economic policy. Just consider the massive rollout that is happening now of in investment screening regulations across the globe or bans on foreign technologies and technology providers such as what has happened in China's Huawei or export restrictions which has prevented ASML from exporting its high-tech chip printing machines to China. 
But at the same time, we can observe a clearly outward and transnationally oriented movement. Consider again the increasingly global over operations of sovereign funds and state-owned enterprises. What is more, these are not stagnant bureaucracies. Many are highly competitive organizations capable of competing on world markets. Now, so far, I've presented what we believe, if conceptually quite abstract, to be more accurate and analytically productive as a, a conceptualization of state capitalism, which helps us understand why and how it manifests, and more importantly, why now in 2023. If there's anything you should take away from this part of my lecture, it is that we are in a state capitalist moment. We see the aggregate rise of states as owners, promoters, and supervisors across the capi world capitalist economy. State capitalism is not reducible to simply China or other emerging markets. There is certainly considerable institutional di diversity in terms of how states are intervening and in engaging with markets, as well as different modalities of state intervention. Whatever the, the variation, the state is back, and it is back everywhere. If secular stagnation and the changing international division of labor are two key capitalist transformations driving the emergence of state capitalism as a global phenomenon, again, global, I say that, what are other, the other transformations on the horizon? The most obvious, I would say, is climate change. Indeed, how will climate change transform capitalism? Climate change is already and will increasingly cause at least a partial reorganization of the geographic structure of the world economy. Adapting to the climate change that is already baked in will be an enormous challenge and cost. And this will inevitably ca cause, and it already is, significant social, political, and geopolitical tensions. Likewise, we don't know which mitigation efforts will be successful. But we already see movement to remake our carbon-based economies with countries and corporations jockeying for technological dominance. There's also a race for critical minerals necessary for the energy transition. Daniel Jurgen, who became famous for his 1991 book, The Prize, which chronicled the history of the global petroleum industry, he said recently that we are shi seeing a shift from big oil to big shovel as we require more and more minerals for electrification. This will entail a different geography of extraction than we currently have. For fossil fuel exporters, the question of transition to a post or at least drastically reduced hydrocarbon world is not a question of if, but of when. In short, there are many reasons to believe that the state capitalist impulse will accelerate as states politically mediate the effects of climate change on the natural environment, as well as the economic dislocations and opportunities that come from this. But states will necessarily be key to decarbonization, given that states are already significant owners of carbon assets. As such, we must, take the, we must ask what role states play as owners. Now, working with Milan Babich in a related project, I sought to understand the role of states as owners of carbon capital. And that, by, by that, we mean ownership of firms in carbon-intensive industries, such as petroleum extraction and processing, steel, cement, fertilizers, aerospace, transportation, and so on. There has been a lot of research on national oil companies, but this doesn't capture the extent of state ownership in carbon-intensive industries. Our aim was to understand the entire picture. And this includes capturing other state-owned enterprises, but also state ownership, including as a minority shareholder through other mechanisms such as sovereign funds, other state holding companies, and in some cases, public pension funds. But rather than approach this through debates on state capitalism, we took a different tact and engaged with the work of the so-called environmental state, making a conceptual as well as empirical contribution. This literature frames the state as governing environmental risks in that the state oversees market processes and addresses problems related to the market's externalization of environmental costs. By this logic, the environmental state is separated from markets, which it regulates and shapes towards sustainability. This is Environmental Economics 101, for those that teach it. At a most basic level, environmental governance consists of regulations. States create laws and provisions that rule out or limit certain environmentally harmful practices. Second, states can incentivize different actors to change their behavior to meet environmental targets set by the state. This can be done through taxation or other market-based mechanisms. Third, the state can intervene 
through strategic industrial policy aimed at green industrial transformation. One aspect of intervention, which we think warrants a, an additional category of environmental governance, is state ownership. Again, states not only regulate and govern markets, but states are also owners, shareholders, investors, and lenders in carbon-intensive firms. In short, states are also market actors themselves. Hence, we add ownership as an important yet mostly overlooked aspect of the environment to state, particularly given the state capitalist moment we are in. Now, at its core, decarbonization implies the lowering or complete elimination of greenhouse gas emissions. Depending on the degree of ownership and control over a firm or specific assets, states as owners and investors have some level of influence over decarbonization strategies. And what are these strategies? We distinguish between three modes of state carbon capital de decarbonization. The first is simple divestment, that is selling off of carbon assets. An example of this would be the Norwegian wealth, sovereign wealth fund's decision to divest from oil and gas, gas exploration. But the immediate effectiveness of divestment is often rather low. Another investor will always come along if money is left on the table. As such, divestment campaigns are not that promising. The scale of divestment is too small to fundamentally change the cost of capital for carbon, carbon industries, and hence too small to materially alter business models. A second means of decarbonization is to redirect carbon investment into renewable energy sources, <coughs> assuming that abatement is even technologically possible. An example of this is the Danish state-owned utility Orsted, which managed to sell off most of its carbon assets within a decade and use the revenues to decrease massively the carbon intensity of its power generation. Although this strategy effectively reduced the carbon intensity of Orsted's balance sheet, there are similar constraints as a pure divestment strategy. In the case of Orsted, it was even another state-owned ve vehicle in Denmark, Energinet, which bought its oil and gas infrastructure. Nevertheless, state-led large-scale investment redirection like this can have a triple positive effect on decarbonization. It strips investment from carbon assets, it sends a powerful signal to other businesses, and it supports economies of scale, at least the development of economies of scale for alternative energy sources. A third option is phasing out. This means holding on to carbon ownership, stopping production successively and letting the remaining asset strand. For example, French state invested utility, NG, started to divest from its coal business with some plants being fully shut down. One example is the Hazelwood coal power facility in Australia in 2017, which was one of the country's uh, worst polluters. While this is arguably the most effective strategy of real decarbonization, it is also the most difficult and problematic from an economic and political standpoint. But our extension of the environmental state literature to include ownership is not a one-way street. We can ask how this dimension of the environmental state can interact with other governance-centered aspects to build more effective decarbonization strategies. In terms of regulation, states can enact ambitious decarbonization goals that apply to state-owned enterprises solely, or state-owned entities. In this way, strenuous and long-winded conflicts with other private actors can be avoided or at least you'd like to think they could be. For example, states can mandate that their sovereign funds decarbonize at a faster pace, or they can mandate their state-owned utility firms to prioritize environmental over profit goals without having to deal with the resistance and delay by non-state actors. Furthermore, states can incentivize decarbonization by assuming some of the financial risks in developing green assets and projects. In other words, they can incentivize green um, industrialization through de-risking strategies. On the intervention side, states could propel the rapid decarbonization of their state-owned enterprises through capital injections to turn these firms into green national champions. Or states could force the firms in which they all hold a veto stake to, up to adopt more ambitious decarbonization goals. Or states could veto regressive brown projects by management. But we also wanted to complement this conceptual lens by mapping today's landscape of the state as global owner of carbon capital. Drawing on firm level ownership data from the Orbis database, which Milan had significant experience in navigating, we analyzed the geographical spread, the investment profiles, that is whether investment is portfolio or controlling, 
and the domestic decarbonization potentials of major carbon owning states. We were able to show that carbon state capital is owned by a few very large, uh, few large states as owners and mostly is domestic. This is to be expected given the weight of national oil companies and energy utilities. Only slightly more than 8% of, of all carbon state capital is financial investment via portfolio stakes in our data set. Against this, almost 78% uh, uh, is in majority ownership and is hence represents mostly non-liquid capital. For global decarbonization efforts, this is suboptimal as most carbon assets are stuck in large company stakes. As this graph shows, we also wanted to understand the relative potential of states as owners in relation to their domestic economy, that is their decarbonization potential. This concerns first the absolute size of state carbon ownership based on our, uh, our database, that is the x-axis, in combination with the relative size of this investment compared to domestic GDP, the x-axis. In short, this comparison, and we didn't do any fancy statistics if you're wondering, allows us to gauge whether high profile owners are also uh, able to divest more easily given the relation of this investment to their total GDP. Now unsurprisingly, both factors correlate strongly with large scale fossil owners also being quite dependent on these carbon investments. For illustration purposes, we can highlight three different groups that exemplify the different political situations states as owners face. First, the red colored dots here example are, are examples that represent strong cases of dependence on carbon state cap capital. So for instance, Kuwait and Azerbaijan own carbon capital in excess of their current GDP. This implies not only a general dependence on oil revenues or some other hydrocarbon for the economy, but a strong political dependence on, of the state as an owner of said income and assets. And this would be, is all to be expected. In the case of Norway, however, which has a high carbon state capital to GDP ratio, most of Norway's state capital is ownership is in transnational portfolio stakes. These are in principle more liquid and hence potentially more open to re rapid decarbonization efforts. A second relevant type of owner here in blue are countries such as South Korea, Germany, or France that based on GDP are less dependent on fossil ownership, but still have significant stakes in carbon firms. Those states as owners are economically and often also less pol politically less dependent on their carbon portfolios. Hence, rapid decarbonization steps are not likely to lead to political breakdown and can at the same time make a real difference on the global scale. In addition, the rapid decarbonization of domestic energy production and consumption could propel technological innovation in renewables and grant these often industrial countries first mover advantages in green industries. A third example are the states here in green which display relevant amounts of state carbon ownership but lower state carbon capital to GDP ratios. Countries like the US, Japan, and UK still own significant stakes in carbon capital. At the same time, neither the domestic economy nor their political system hinges on the state as, as carbon owner. In this respect, decarbonization efforts would be much easier and faster to implement than, is some, than some of the more dependent petrostates, as mentioned earlier. And this we would expect. Now, you will have noticed that I've used the word potential a lot in discussing states as owners in decarbonization. There's certainly a lot of potential, but recognizing potential does not necessarily mean we should assume that such potential can or will be realized. The current state capitalist conjuncture or moment, if you like, certainly offers an interesting window of opportunity for driving decarbonization and hence sustainability. But nothing is ever that simple. Change as it always has been, is messy, and I would say everything is fundamentally political. At the same time, we should take with some caution any grandiose plan to fundamentally alter or change the status quo, even if changing the status quo is desperately needed. Indeed, to take a quote from Adam Smith, and I said I wouldn't make this lecture about Adam Smith, but I kind of lied, the great body of the party are commonly intoxicated with the imaginary beauty of this ideal system, of which they have no experience, but which has been represented to them in all the most dazzling colors 
in which the eloquence of their leaders could paint it. And that's from the theory of moral sentiments. So the question I have, and I would like to pose, will state capitalism drive a more sustainable form of capitalism? That is a question for the future and for more research. On that note, I'd like to thank you for coming this evening. Thank you for your time and your attention, and thank you for your support. Thank you very much indeed for uh, your, your lecture and your thoughts, and so much there for us to think about. Probably too much. Not at all. <laughs> um, and now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are open for discussion and questions. So if you would like to make a point or ask a question, um, because we are recording some of this, there is a microphone available, and uh, a microphone will come to you. Yes. Yes. Uh, Michael Keating from Royal Society of Edinburgh. Yes. That, that was absolutely tremendous, uh, Adam, an extraordinary overview of things. I just want to pick you up really where you finished, because I'm a political scientist, yeah. and I just want to know a little bit about the politics in particular, how you conceptualize the state. What is this state that's doing all this stuff? Yeah. Is it something autonomous from society? Are you talking about political power? How far is it captured by private interests? Mm. And particularly in the last bit about environmentalism, where does populism come? Because mm. the state now has been affected by, by populism of all sorts, yeah. which presumably would complicate the sort of active policy that you've mm -hmm. been talking about. But so so uh, a simple answer to the, to the first part. I often in, there's approaches in political economy that treat the state, uh, state as separate from the market as kind of operating above. Um, I take a more fundamentally a, a different view where the state is fundamental to the market economy. It's fundamental to how markets operate. And that's why the, the capitalist state, the literature that I'm kind of engaging with is the likes of Poulancis, uh, Miliband, um, uh, uh, Simon Clark, kind of more Marxian oriented uh, theories of the state which doesn't make you a Marxist if you engage with that literature, where you know, it says that the state has a fundamental role to play in how markets, are, um, how markets operate. Now, we can have a lot of variety in that, right, in terms of the political system and, and how the political system plays in terms of, of defining what markets can and cannot do. Um, on the point about environmentalism and populism, the, the slide I had on, on climate change had a picture, it had two pictures. One was a picture of the Gilets Jaunes, and the other picture was of a open pit mine of artisanal miners in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And those are the two kind of political, I think, issues that we face in terms of the energy transition is that, in as much as we'd like to drive our Teslas and we'd like to electrify, um, most people, if we look at the costs of transition, won't be able to bear those costs. And then we have to look at the geography of extraction, where this is coming from. And there's going to be significant inequalities. And that's why I kind of led on this, this sort of, I wouldn't say dour note, but a bit in the sense that state capitalism will drive the politically mediate these, these particular um, uh, 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 problems. but. You know, there's no guarantee. Uh, put it this way: I don't want to have a normative view that state capitalism is going to, and more state is going to solve these problems. Because just as much as we'd like to think that a more active industrial policy is what we need to go green, uh, I take a more kind of skeptical view. This is where I put my libertarian hat on and say, well, actually, no. Should we? Uh, will the tr will the state be better, even even better than, let's say, the market in addressing addressing these these issues? I wonder if I could ask mm. a question. Uh, your chair is entitled uh, Sustainable Capitalism. Yeah. If you were to be writing a definition for that, right. what might that be? Right, so I think this is, so I'm, I'm apprehensive to define state capitalism. <coughs> and the w reason why I'm not is, I'm, and this is where I'm gonna kind of bring in Adam Smith here, is I don't think Adam Smith would have I mean, he was writing in a period that was pre-capitalist, um, pre-industrial, but I don't think he would have provided a definition of sustainable capitalism. He would ask, well, what, do you, what kind of capitalism do you want? <coughs> and what does it take you to get to being sustainable? 
So again, I think that's, that's the, the question for us is that, yes, we need to take carbon out of the atmosphere. We know that it has um, deleterious effects to the environment, but how, how do we get there? Does it mean that, okay, so we electrify in the global north, but that means that we're massively destroying the environment in the global south? And I think also it's the, the issue of, well, you know, you know, whilst capitalism is very dynamic and drives innovation, we know historically that not everyone benefits and there's still, um, you know, challenges around inequality. And I think that's where I'm reluctant to say this is this sustainable capitalism because I look at it as an aspiration. And, and the aspiration is that we have a, an economic system that is dynamic, it is innovative, it allows individuals <coughs> and groups of individuals to, to make their own decisions, but at the same time ensures that we're not destroying the environment, that we're lifting up as many people as possible, not simply in our own countries, but around the world. Thinking about state capitalism and politics and accountability, where does this go? Um, if we if we start with China and mm. you cited the Chinese model, mm. we see what's happening with um, a sort of almost New Deal mm. Mark II in the United States with the IRA mm -hmm. and all the other examples that you cited. Where do you think th what the inf impact do you think this will have on? the politics of our times and, mm. and beyond, and accountability, if that makes sense. Right, so I think this is what I find really, really interesting is that in our book, it's, it's the book is about 120,000 words, so it's quite, quite dense, but um, we make the argument that state capitalism begets state capitalism. Right, so so much of the state capitalism that we're seeing in the, the West today, in, in the United States, across Europe, is directly in response to China and uh, Chinese state capitalism. Um, and the problem, the example I think you would see is how Britain today is politically trying to understand where it sits with Europe, where it sits with the United States, and where it sits with China. So whereas the United States, which has more firepower than, it, than it, you know, it can print money and it's a it's huge economy. Its response has been, we're gonna take on China and we're going to um, massively invest into green technologies. We're going to, we're gonna meet the challenge. The Europeans, um, European Union is uh, quickly trying to do the same thing. Here in Britain, you find that, oh, wait a minute, we have to be good liberals and we have to see even with, and you can't find even politically, right? So it's not uh, kind of a left-right issue. You have those that want to be good liberals and say, well, the state should not. But if the, the risk for, for Britain or any other country is that if you don't react, where does that leave you? Because you'll be left with, you know, when China's subsidizing industry and the United States is subsidizing, where does it leave you? Because they subsidize to benefit their own their own countries. I mean, that's the risk of, I would say, of state capitalism spiraling out of out of out of control, um, leading to you know uh, political problems in places like the UK that aren't aren't going to keep up. But doesn't there isn't actually the firepower to 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 address that? Um, so Pop, if that goes to your question, Jeremy. Yeah. Or do, okay. James and then people are warming up now. That's good. Oh, that's get, good. Get those hands ready. It's always the way, isn't it? That's yes. the first question. Um, Adam, could I take you back amidst all the interesting things you said mm -hmm. to one of your earliest and almost, if I may, throwaway comments mm -hmm. that if there was anything that was state capitalism, yeah. it was the American defense regime. Yes. Doesn't that alter the narrative quite a lot, though? Because mm. that element of the state has not been away, right. at least since, I guess, the 1960s, mm. um, with acceleration mm -hmm. since then. Mm -hmm. How do you fit that into your thought process? Mm. About it? I mean, one could argue that that has actually been a more, for all its f side effects of, of horrors, 
that's been a more effective form of state mm -hmm. capitalism mm -hmm. um, than even the Chinese version. Right. You know, so I think that's, I mean, as I said er, you know, I earlier, you know, when, when we were faced with um, do we even bother kind of engaging with this thing called state capitalism? Because y there's a lot of reasons to say, well, this is just the capitalist state. But one reason why I, start I felt that we needed to do something was you know, yeah, China is obviously state capitalist, but I always thought to myself, you know, but, you know, and this is almost defending the Chinese, and I don't want to defend the Chinese, but if you talk to Chinese policymakers and, you know, they'll turn around and say, yeah, but you're doing this, 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 and this, and you're a bunch of hypocrites, and what we're doing, you know, formally, yes, we have more ownership, but look at the ties between private industry and, you know, the CEO of JP Morgan or a major corporation in the United States can pick up the phone and probably get the President of the United States on. Absolutely, Absolutely right? So how is that any different? I mean, there's m significant difference differences in terms of you know, uh, liberal foundations of our society, which is, I think, a separate, a separate issue. But back on the U.S. defense thing, and that is why you know, it was things like the U.S. defense budget or massive quantitative easing where you know, big central banks were just saying, we'll just take everything. You know, and they're notionally independent, but you know, it's, they takes everything off. And so we said we have to kind of engage in the say that that state capitalism exists in the West, and it's a, a, a feature. But this is why our our the theoretical kind of advance that we're trying to make is say, this state capitalist impulse, right? That it's yeah. not something that's that's on all the time. And so in the U.S. case, you know, you had periods where. I guess during Reagan, you could say well, actually they increased spending, right? So the neoliberals were not very good at kind of cutting cutting government, and even though they like to think they were, I think it's um, for us it's about that impulse. And, and the other aspect of what we're trying to do is to say why now? Why is it globally so fundamental that 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 we see? Why is it, why now in 2023? In the last uh, 20 years, we've seen a massive increase in states as owners, and we see the explicit. Right, so it's not simply the U.S. defense budget, but it's all the other things that are added, being added on, and it's not simply the United States, it's across the board, and that's why I think it's that, it's that combination that we find to be so interesting and why we think we're in a period that is a, a state capitalist moment, if you like. Jeff Henderson from the University of Bristol, which was where I met Adam, uh, uh, we were colleagues. Yes, we thanks for coming, other, Jeff. When it, when Long time. It? More than, um, yeah. 2010, maybe earlier. Yeah, than that. I don't know. earlier. Anyway, yeah. I, if I can, a sort of just a riff on the, on the previous mm. question. Um, one of the most interesting experiences of state capitalism uh, for me, uh, certainly historically, but it's still around there today in various ways, uh, were the, uh, the Northeast Asian so-called developmental mm -hmm. states. Mm -hmm. What was interesting with them, of course, certainly mm -hmm. about Japan, and uh, South Korea and uh, less so, at least initially, Taiwan, mm -hmm. which did have significant state-owned mm -hmm. enterprises, um, was that this was a state that had a vision of how to drive mm -hmm. uh, towards an economic future and indeed, to some extent, a political future, where they effectively tightly regulated um, privately owned, in the case of uh, South Korea, quite uh, substantial I, uh, uh, business corporations, mm -hmm. <coughs> towards particular goals set by states, economic planners. And um, it seems to me that, I, and that's something that really wasn't included mm -hmm. in, your, in your presentation. And it's important in various ways, not least of which, of course, is that it's the, it's the, um, it gives the lie, in a sense, mm. to the idea that industrial po policy sort of passed out of, uh, you know, use became of uh, less interest. Yeah. That's that's largely, I think, a Euro-American right. perception, right? Mm -hmm. So if you actually take in the uh, the Northeast Asian cases, if you take in Singapore, Singapore, interestingly, mm -hmm. uh, also has significant state ownership in its yep. operations, something Still. like. 15% of GDP, mm. maybe more in yeah. Singapore, is generated by state-owned companies. Mm. Uh, so much for Singapore on Thames, you know, yes. uh, the Tory <laughs> party. They don't, they don't tell us that, type of st uh, that part of the story, mm. right? Um, um, 
so I, I, my point is, is, is that it seems to me remains potentially a very significant element in this story. And it's also potentially, surely, um, uh, a source of lessons yeah. for various, particularly in terms of the developing world. Yeah. And I wondered what you, what you thought about that. No, 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 that's an excellent question, I think. And this is where, um, so we do talk about the developmental state literature quite a bit in the book. It is, it, we, we go through that. And I think there's one of the motivations for doing that is that when we talk about state capital or state capitalism, the developmental state literature is the first to be brought up and say, look, look what look what they did, and they had this kind of, and so, in in, in those examples, I think yeah, you had this very kind of rigid, directive, almost authoritarian, um, as it were, um, in places like South Korea. But I think what's also important, and, and this is what we're trying to move away from in our, <coughs> our work, is the simple kind of comparison between different countries and trying to build in a more global perspective. Because even in the case of the Northeast Asian developmental states, you know, Singapore, South Korea, they benefited from massive support of, of the United States military and being part of the kind of American kind of global system. And so it's that global story that we want to bring in where we find that if it's just the developmental state, then it doesn't quite get there. And one other response to that is a lot of the kind of comparative work that we saw in analyzing state capitalism would, you would find, I mean, depending on what kind of variables you could use, you can basically make any country a state capitalist country. And often they would, they, the, the way the literature, in particular sort of comparative varieties of capitalism, they would under theorize, um, you know, these particular relationships between the bureaucracy and state capital. And they would say, you know, things would be say, well, it's state capitalists are as a particular str particularly strong state. And you think, well, what does strong mean? Is, 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 you know, is the United States government not strong? Is, is you know, I've lived in Britain long enough to know that the, the British government is very active in most things that we do. And if you work in higher education, you have to, <laughs> you're they're constantly getting directives and you think, you know, so what is strong in that case? But I think definitely, I mean, with the, the, I guess the easier answer is that it's building in that global aspect to it. So um, we've got a comment from Sir Jeff, maybe yeah. a comment from the front, and then a comment coming from, from the back. So yes. we've got our next three okay. lined up. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, Adam, but is, is there a, some sort of conflict between state capitalism and morality? <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to th think how to, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's it. You've stumped me. Uh, you're supposed to only ask questions about brewing methods. No, I think, y you know, this is where I, what I find really interesting is that there are there's, so it, we, in the last chapter of the book and a lot of the discussions that Elise and I had, you, mean you have those that look at state capitalism, let's say on the left, as an opportunity. They look at state ownership as a means of kind of greening and socializing and making capitalism better um, and, and therefore sort of morally more legitimate. Um, but I kind of don't take a stand, I, I, you know, there's, there's because I think, again, you could have, say, let's say, a state ownership of a bank or, or you could set up a, a state investment fund and you, in principle, think it might be better because it's more politically legitimate. But then again, I'm not always so sure that it's necessarily going to be more legitimate and more, let's say, socially aware. We would like to think it is, but I, th I, I, I think it's an empirical question. Like, I don't think more state is necessarily better, right? I think it can be, but I think that's, uh, that's it, it depends on the case, and it's, there's too many contingencies. Thank you. So, uh, Maya check. we've got a comment at the front, and then we're going okay. to the back. Yes. Uh, will climate change stop? Oh. <laughs> Because you were talking about climate change. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, the great thing about Panmere House is that we bring uh, a 
it's open to people of all ages, actually. We have a Smith <laughs> School program, so, so you know, it's, she's not the first 11-year-old that's been in, in these, these, this room. Will climate change stop? I, I, well, the climate is always changing, right? So it, the question is, will human-induced climate change and the effects of it slow down such that we, you know, you know, the question is, how do we adapt to climate change that is already baked in, which is... Future. You'll have a great future, Faith. <laughs> um, Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay. And the question at the back. Yeah. I think we all like the an last answer. Yes. So <laughs> great. Um, Will Dowson from the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. uh, you described the last couple of decades as a state capitalist moment. Mm. What are you looking for to see when this moment might end or peak? Mm. No, that's a very good question. Um, so I think two things to say. One is, again, and this goes to kind of James's question that, that, that you know, it's always recognizing the state is always there s in some form doing something. Um, this particular state capitalist moment, I think it's uh, how solvent is the Chinese economy? Um, but the problem with that is that, you know, China deals with crises differently than we do here, um, if we even know what's going on. Um, and they'll use repression in ways that we won't hear. Um, Though it seems that the West is also pretty good at using repression for protests and the like in interesting ways. Um, you know, politically in the United States, it's interesting because the Republicans and the Democrats are, you know, they're lockstep on defense spending and, you know, notwithstanding kind of appear appearances of polarization, I think there's, there's more and more, um, and this is why Trump did well, was, you know, he said, well, we need to compete with China, we need to bring back manufacturing. If, it, if we need to spend money, then let's do that. And so I think you have both sides doing it. And so I think it's the question of how long that will run its course in the United States. And I'm just saying these are the two biggest ones. Um, and the other, you know, so there's those, but those are countries that can do stuff. I mean, in a lot of countries, and this is something I didn't really emphasize, is that there's significant, there's a most states are very weak in terms of having the financial power to do just about anything. Um, but again, we don't necessarily look at, f at state capitalism as a quotient of, of capital. There's a lot you can do as a state, as a regulator, as you know, setting up a, you know, a platform to, to, to attract capital for that matter. But I, mean, I, can't, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think there's, you know, from the big economies, there's also, also limits. But the interesting thing, and again, this is why, you know, going back to, to Sir Jeff's question, is that during the pandemic and during the financial crisis, states and central banks showed themselves to be able to do a lot of amazing things that we didn't think were possible, right? It's like, oh, well, you know, we can bail out this sector. We bail, and then you sort of, if you take that logic, then there's a lot more we can do in terms of addressing issues like climate change, but we just choose not to. But I don't know if what the future holds. <laughs> uh, very last question <laughs> then. The uh, front here is, oh, is it dog? Oh, to the dog. And you can corner me downstairs <laughs> once I have a drink, too, if you have more <laughs> questions. So the question is really uh, more about the relationship between, on, on one side, you have various forms of state capitalism, whether mm. it's your, you know, sovereign wealth funds or other. And when you were talking about it earlier, it's, they, it's almost like the state is wearing a bunch of different hats. Mm -hmm. They have sit, you know, in all the chairs around the table, which I think from a governance perspective is, is dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe you have different forms of different this in different countries where mm -hmm. the beneficiaries yeah. of state capitalism could maybe be argued that in some places are for the, f um, the bene you know, it's for the few, mm -hmm. and in other places may maybe for the many. Yeah. And what's the, have you looked at the relationship between all of this and how that affects mm. the sustainability of state capitalism? Right. So, no, no that's, that's an excellent question, Doug. Um, so I think, you know, this is where the Chinese will say, look how many people we brought out of poverty in the last 
30 years. I mean, the, the, the success story of the last 30 or 40 years is unfortunately the, the, the success of the Chinese Communist Party and what it did to leave, bring people out of poverty. And very much of that was, was due to state capital. Though, the caveat to that is that it was also China becoming more kind of integrated in the global capitalist system. And, you know, it can't just say that, oh, it was the, the CCP that, that, that did that. Um, but it still offers legitimacy to the C CCP that look what we've done, look how fast we've developed. And so that why it, that's why it's a kind of an attractive model, if you like, for a lot of countries to that now <laughs> looking at to China from the global south that say, well, actually, you know, we just need more state, and this is how we develop. Um, but we know from experience that that is probably not the norm, and that <laughs> this is where I think the danger is, is a lot of forms of, let's say, state capital can be in support of military regimes, and you look certain countries like Egypt or Pakistan, you know, the, the military owns, you know, cereal makers and all kinds of things, you know, and it doesn't necessarily benefit people. So I think that's the... <coughs> an interesting aspect, but I think one of the takeaways, though, that I probably didn't emphasize this enough about state capitalism is it's not counter to say like the mar the market function, right? Because many of these state-owned enterprises and many of the kind of industrial policies are still very pro-market, right? They're still, you know, so these state-owned enterprises are trying to compete or sovereign wealth funds. I mean, you look at the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund, right? That they are they op. I mean, they could do a lot more with their capital, but they still operate just like any other large institutional investor. Um, yeah, there's certain mandates that they get from government, but it's not like this politically oriented um, uh, thing. But I, yeah, it's a longer kind of response than I have time for, but. <laughs> oh. so, um, Adam, I'd just like to say thank you again. And in a moment, I'm going to invite uh, Professor Leng up to uh, make a few remarks, but thank you so much for addressing us and for your questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Adam, thank you very, very much for an absolutely fantastic and stimulating, stimulating lecture. I'm always a believer that you can judge the quality of a lecture by the quality of the debate you have afterwards. And I think we can all do agree we've had an excellent discussion, an excellent debate of some of the really significant issues that we as a society face today. And it very much confirms why those months ago we took that bold, rash <laughs> decision to appoint Adam. And it absolutely confirms the quality of the decision that we made. What I didn't realize at the time was that I owe Olga a debt of gratitude <laughs> for encouraging you to come to this cold, wet city of, of, of Edinburgh. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. Running counter to that, Adam, you gave me a moment where I had a frisson of alarm. You said, where I go next? <laughs> now, I think you were meaning it in a slightly different way, intellectually rather than physically. But it took me a couple of, it took me a couple of moments to, 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 to realize that. But then once I realized that, I was fairly, then fairly confident that you would not be moving because where else could you sit, have a chair, to debate the great issues that face us today, that in the house that Adam Smith <laughs> resided in. It is, we are creating here, and Adam is an absolutely central part of that, a place not only for critical debate about the future of business, society, but also a place where we create some of that cutting edge thinking. So, Adam, can I just ask all of us to join together in, once again, expressing our thanks for the lecture and the fact that we look forward to many successful years of you occupying the Adam Smith Chair in Sustainable Capitalism. Thank you, Thank you so much. much.